everybody. Welcome to another drive through FM podcast. Today we're going to jump in and talk about uh, my experience at Gen Con 2018. I just got back uh, yesterday, actually, at the time of this recording, and I'm putting this together, and we're just kind of run through the whole experience. I'll talk a lot about games, I'll talk a lot about people, and so on, and the event itself. And I've been trying to sort of organize my thoughts over the last couple of days about how I would present it. Do I do like a top 10 list of the games I saw there? You know, what do I do? The difficult part with doing something kind of concrete like that is that I got a chance to play some new games a couple of times. I got a chance to play some new games once. I got demos of games where we played about a half a game. I got sort of two to three minute overviews of some games that look really cool, but I don't really have a good sense, you know, of playing the game or anything like that. So I thought I would kind of break the podcast down in sort of a ascending roller coaster where it just keeps going up, up, and up, and up, and hopefully never down. But uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of jump in. I've got a little bit of housekeeping I want to do, and then I'll talk about a couple of things I saw real briefly I didn't really care for, and then kind of ramp it up into stuff that I got a sort of a look at, and then stuff I got a more close look at, and then stuff that I actually played maybe a couple of times and sort of ended on a high note with some just kind of personal experiences. Uh, so the first kind of housekeeping note that I want to bring up is there were some incidents that happened at Gen Con that I wanted to speak very quickly and briefly about. There was a couple of incidents of, unfortunately, of violence in a couple of cases and also harassment and stuff like that of people uh, that were there. There was a YouTuber there harassing. There was a guy that punched that YouTuber. And then there was a publisher that got into somewhat of an altercation uh, with some of the staff there and stuff like that. So I just wanted to speak out a little tiny brief moment about that, that I find all of that, the harassment, uh, the violence by the publisher and whoever the other guy was. Uh, I don't want to name any of these people. I'm not here to like, you know, get people into trouble or call them out or get them arrested. And I also don't want to give them views and oxygen to their crappy YouTube channels, if that's what I'm going to do here. I don't want any of that to happen. What I do want to see, though, is hopefully some kind of crackdown. Uh, because this kind of thing it happened at Origins and to some degree, and it's happened at other cons, and there were some other sort of tweets and stuff I saw about some other kind of uh, stuff that you would think of as more typical harassment, which is a friggin' awful phrase to phrase. Um, but I would like to see Gen Con and Origins and all the other conventions sort of step up and say, hey, we don't condone any kind of violence uh, in and around the con, whether it's at the convention center or at a bar outside it or whatever. We don't do condone any kind of harassment, any kind of just you know antagonistic type of behavior. They're all private companies. They can make their own decisions. They can ban who they want. And that's what I think needs to happen in a few of these cases, frankly, is these folks need multi-year bans. I don't know about lifetime bans. I'm kind of a type of person that feels that there's redemption at the arc of a lost soul, so to speak, not to get like religious overtones, but in general, I think that people should have a redemptive arc. And that's something that I want to happen for everybody on this planet. Uh, but I also think there all should be consequences for your actions. And any action that is taken to make, in particular, Gen Con less safe for everybody that attends it is something that I'm not in favor of whatsoever, 100%. Whether it's punching somebody you don't like, or harassing people or whatever. If you're doing stuff in the community at large in general, whether it's at Gen Con, around Gen Con, leading up to Gen Con, I personally don't want you there. I don't want to see your face there. So I would appreciate it personally, not just for my own safety. My own safety is not a concern here. I'm talking about the safety of everybody that's attending there. I think that this kind of thing needs, needs to be banned outright and just thrown aside. Uh, because frankly, um, it's a little personal for me because Gen Con was fantastic this year. It was amazing. I loved every minute of it. It was Gen Con is my favorite convention out of all the different conventions I've been to. Origins. I've been to PAX Unplug. I've been to small conventions. I've been to the Shut Up and Sit Down convention. All those conventions are awesome. Every single one of them is great. I score all of them like an eight or nine out of ten. Gen Con, I get like a nine point five out of ten for myself. Uh, this year especially, it really, I just did a whole bunch of fun stuff. I walked around and talked to publishers. I didn't really get too crazy doing kind of like quote unquote media work. You know, I just kind of cruised around and talked to people, random people, interviewed them, got a chance to talk to designers and publishers directly. Uh, I had a chance to play a lot of games in the BGG hotness room. Uh, that was fantastic. You know, played games in the hotel lobbies and all that stuff. And it was just a great vibe, a great atmosphere. 
and I want it to keep existing. There's still like some magic for me there. There's a good balance for me in terms of the games that I'm playing, the people, the friendly faces I see, all the smiles and everything of people I only see at Gen Con or at conventions. And there's that whole grand spectacle of the thing with the whole, you know, giant fantasy flight booth and the giant Aiello booth and the giant Mayfair booth and the Plat Hat booth is getting bigger and bigger every year. And then you see these all these little publishers that are there. Uh, you know, the, they're the the Plat Hats of the future and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it just gets me super excited. And everybody's so jazzed to talk to me about their game or the design or what they're demoing and all that stuff. And even on Saturday and Sunday when they're hoarse and exhausted and just would rather be at home with their families and all that stuff, they are still find some energy in themselves to get fired up. Uh, not only if they're the designer or the publisher, but these are people that are volunteering. They're there like fired up and passionate about the games because they love them. And uh, it's just a great all-around energy and vibe, and the city transforms and all that fun stuff. So anyway, I think they need to ban some people, 100%. 100% just ban them five years. Done. You're out. You're going to come in here and cause harm to the community. I don't care who you are, what you think, or what your belief system is. Out. Done. You should be gone. Now, that's not my call, but I think these uh, cons, especially Gen Con, are in a position of immense power and influence within the larger gaming community and they have the ability and the uh, uh the, i think the necessary necessity to do something like that uh so anyway so that's the done negative stuff crap in the garbage and now we're going to move on to well some more stuff that didn't excite me because i'm going to start talking about games and so a handful of games i played that was like yeah i don't know i don't like it that much talk very briefly uh so the first one is uh ticket to ride new york yeah it's 15 minute ticket to ride that's it, the end. <laughs> Let's move on to the next game. Yeah, Ticket to Ride, 15 minutes in New York City. Okay, that's that's not that fun. I just played it uh, once two-player, but I had enough of it. Uh, the next one that I didn't care for was the Transformers card game, which is like a collectible card game from Wizards of the Coast. We played sort of a half-baked thing with the starter set where we broke it apart, and it wasn't like a full game. Uh, and we got the actual rules downloaded off the website because they don't come in the box. There are rules in the box to play a game that's frankly designed for little kids to play uh, where you don't like using any of the text in the card and yeah, I don't know, it's not really a game. Uh, and then we got the rules off the website and walked through that and it's still barely a game and just wasn't very good, I thought. Uh, but caveat that we played kind of with half decks and half uh, fleets of Transformers. Still, I didn't frankly see where there would be any redeeming quality <laughs> even if we played the complete realistic uh, full game. Uh, but frankly, those were the only two real duds of games, uh, Ticket to Ride New York and the Transformers collectible card game. Now, there was a couple of games that I got a chance to either play a, a full game of or kind of a half a game, but, but where I'm still like, I, I don't really have my mind made up. I'm not really leaning to the point where I'm that excited about them, uh, but th I could see like if somebody brought them, I'd be like, okay, let's give that another shot. Uh, so the first one that I kind of played about a half a game or so is from Simon, and that's the Kick-Ass uh, board game. So Kick-Ass is a comic book property that they made into a couple of movies, and it's a cooperative game, and you're playing characters from the movie. Now, the theme of it actually kind of makes a lot of sense with what they did. It's sort of, the, if you're not familiar with the property, it's sort of a more realistic approach to superheroes. Uh, there's nobody with special magical powers. It's just kind of regular, everyday uh, schmoes, uh, you know, that decide they were crazy and they want to actually be a superhero in real life and sort of the struggles they deal with. And you have to like get uh, like social media following and stuff and spend your own money and all that kind of crazy stuff. It's a co-op and it was okay. Like we only played a half a game and it had some interesting elements, like I said, with some of the theme stuff woven in. Uh, but it lacked, one friend told me they said that they thought it lacked some of the kind of satire of everyday life and stuff. And I can kind of see that. Um, but I always felt like the original comic was sort of just a silly thing anyway, with a sort of a, a strange pseudo realistic look at if a high school kid wanted to be a superhero. Uh, but yeah, it was just kind of bland in general. There wasn't really anything super special about the mechanics. 
but I would like to try this again and kind of get through the whole playthrough of it and see where it goes. I'd be open to certainly trying it again. Uh, so it's maybe something that I might recommend folks take a look at if they were into that intellectual property or not. Uh, but it, yeah, it just kind of seemed kind of, I don't know, basic, bland, just, just kind of bleh, you know, just kind of there. Uh, the next game that I want to talk about that I was a little bit middling on, we actually did play a full game of this, and that is uh, Railroad Rivals. And we played a full five-player game of it. I think it plays up to five. It might play up to six. Uh, but we played a five-player game of it, and it was like kind of like almost interesting. You get these tiles, and you build these sort of little routes, and then you buy stock in the companies that are labeled on the edge of the tiles, and you make shipments. So it's a, you know it's a train game. Uh, but it, at five players, it had some interesting little moments and decisions, but it felt like it was just really out of my hands. I think I just kind of lucked into third place, and I was like one point behind second place and really didn't spend that much time agonizing over any decisions or anything or just kind of felt like, well, I have to do this because this is the thing I have to do. Otherwise, anything else I do is just not worth it. And, oh, look at that. I almost got first place because I was just a couple more points behind first place. So, yeah. So I think it actually might be more interesting with less players. So there might be some more control. And you have a little bit more say of how the board develops and which stocks are in play and all that kind of stuff. But with five, uh, there's not really a mechanic in there to sort of self-balance when you're out of, uh, you know, out of turn order. Other than bidding on turnover, and that's really it. Uh, so that might be just kind of a new play thing, but also the components and everything were really bland and everything. And it, like I've seen so many different train games and stock games at this point. Yeah, this was with tiles and stuff, so that was a little bit interesting. Uh, but generally, it just kind of steered itself into the sea, and I didn't really feel like I had any engagement with the game or the players, other than bidding for turn order. And it's like, eh, do I give up 10 points? And, you know, it, it just wasn't that engaging in terms of that's the moment of engagement. And the rest of it is just kind of counting up things and saying, okay, that's, that, that's my choice. And there's not really much to it. So that, anyway, was Railroad Rivals. And the last game that I'm a little bit uh, confused about is from Red Raven Games. And this is called Megaland. And it's actually a Target exclusive game. And we had a chance to play that the first night. I think it was there Tuesday night, and we played this. And it was just a kind of a learning game. It's a very interesting concept, and I kind of started off really liking it. And But by the end of the game, it just sort of fizzled out for me. And if you think about it, this, this only makes sense if you've played these two other games. But if you've played Ink and Gold and Machi Koro, it's kind of a mashup of those two mechanics where you're sort of flipping cards and treasure and you're deciding if you want to stay in or stay out. And if you stay in long enough and don't get killed, so to speak, then you, you don't, it's not a killing thing, but you don't get knocked out. Then you get some income and stuff from collecting these different sets of treasure cards. And then you can buy cards. And there's like a, a deal of cards that are always in the game and then some random cards. And they kind of work like Machi Koro, so you just get little buildings and things that'll combo up with what you do, and you trade in uh, varying sets of things, uh, or you can like buy more life for yourself if you trade in pairs and three of a kind, and then you just build up and you think you score to like 20 points or something, I don't remember exactly. Uh, so it's cool, it's interesting, but I don't know, it just kind of fizzled out at the end. But it's something I want to play again, if somebody gets it, I'll certainly play it and take a closer look. But again, it was just one of those where it was a neat, interesting kind of hook with, do I stay in? Do I stay in? I took a little bit of damage. Uh, you know, okay, I've got four health left. Maybe I got this little jump token where I can jump around the monster that gets, you know, shown up. And maybe some cards and things allow me to ignore certain things or do certain little effects. Uh, so it was very tightly, nightly, uh, nicely uh, integrated and designed, but I just kind of felt a little bit flat and bland and the game is certainly designed i think for more of a family night a game night with kids and stuff there's certainly that involved and it was a nice i think kind of next step for you know beyond monopoly and other family games and stuff like that so i think it would be a nice family game and there's certainly some drama and surprise to revealing the monsters or or maybe you get away scot-free or get bonus treasure and stuff so that part of it was kind of fun but then when you kind of start piecing that together and trying to build sort of like a little economy and stuff, it kind of takes away from that. So yeah, I was kind of back and forth on, on Megaland there from Red Raven Games. 
But that's all the stuff that I was sort of middling and negative about. Uh, so we're going to jump into, now I'm going to do stuff that I'm excited about, but I didn't really hear or get that much info about. So I'm kind of tentatively excited without actually having played a full game of it or a couple of games of it. And so we'll just kind of walk through. The first thing I want to mention is uh, CMON on Wednesday, uh, which is kind of like the trade day. They have different events and things. I actually had a chance to play some games of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Champions, the new trading card game, which I played a lot of actually during the course of the convention. And so uh, Play Fusion had a, a little event there. If you were a press or retailer, you could come in and play that. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. So CMON had a similar type of activity that you could come in and do. And that's when Fantasy Flight had their their in-flight report and so that's a lot of that kind of stuff seems to happen the day before the con nowadays and then you jump into the full swing into the convention on thursday so we went to this simon thing and it was a lot of fun you know they had some drinks for everybody and uh and some little snacks and stuff and you kind of wander around eric lang was there a lot of the simon uh, representatives were there all very friendly and uh, congenial and they showed us a few different things i just want to talk about a couple of highlights there's actually something that i had a chance to do a full playthrough of uh, that I'm very excited about that I saw at this uh, CMON event, uh, but I'll mention that later. But there was a lot of other things that we got sort of a, a brief overview from either Eric or another representative there that really got me kind of fired up. And so the first thing I want to mention is a game called Trudveng, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Trudveng Legends. And I think this is coming to Kickstarter. And this is kind of a design uh, by committee. Eric Lang was involved as well as, and I, forgive me if I butcher the names, I've not pronounced these before, uh, Fel Barros and then Guilherme uh, Goulart. I know I butchered that last one, uh, but the game is interesting. So it's kind of a sort of a cooperative -y dudes on the map kind of thing. And obviously I'll be having pictures up here if you're watching this stuff on YouTube for all this stuff. I didn't mention that before. Uh, but I'll have some pictures of this. You get a kind of a visual sense of it. And you got a little map. You're traveling around, kind of doing quests and things. And then sort of uh, political events and other types of major events are going to happen in this world or this sort of half continent. And then it has what's called sort of a savable state. So it's not a legacy game, but it has these little sort of uh, plastic slots that you can slide cards on top of each other in on the main map. And so there's a, those will sometimes reference uh, like an adventure book with lots of different paragraphs that you can read. And you'll be kind of wandering around, adventuring. Think of it, it feels a little bit like a Gloomhaven to me where you're moving around and adventuring, but it's all very sort of a high level uh, focus. You've got that sort of high level map like Gloomhaven, but it doesn't really dive into the full on dungeon crawl. And it's got awesome minis and that whole thing. But it maybe kind of leans more from a Gloomhaven side to uh, sort of a Runebound side, sort of more of an adventure type of thing. And they showed us a very cool mechanic, which reminded me a little bit of Rising Sun. So you're going to draw three tiles, and those are the activations that you're going to do in your turn. So you can activate one of those for yourself, one of those, I believe, for another player, and then one kind of for, uh, I can't remember exactly which, but more for like the AI or something. And so you've kind of sort of a I split and then choose the action. So if you think of uh, some of the drafting games like Biblios and stuff that we've seen from years ago, you go, okay, these are my three actions. Ugh, you know, which one do I take? Do I keep this one? Do I give it to Bobby? Do I hand it off to uh, some action that's an event on the table? That kind of thing. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, abstract mechanic, I think, to kind of get things moving and not make every turn completely overwhelming and chaotic, uh, but to sort of bind you in a certain way to the game add some kind of interesting layers of choices there and then kind of wrap all that around with some adventure story storytelling and some nice persistent effects and things that will last from game to game to game but you don't have to destroy anything which is kind of cool so that's Trudvang Legends. It's a very interesting looking game. I feel like it's kind of uh, a little bit of a risk or or just sort of a departure from you know what we normally see in games, especially what we normally see out of Simon. So that's kind of nice and refreshing to see uh, them kind of tackle something like that. Now this next game from Simon, I'm super interested in, and this is called the Grizzled Armistice Edition. And you can see on YouTube there, it's a big old box, and it's going to contain the base game of Grizzled that you know now, as well as the expansion that came out, I believe, two years ago. Uh, but it's also going to have kind of this historical 
uh, layout of cards that you can kind of play through as sort of a campaign. Uh, so it's going to go from, I think they said 1941 or something, all the way through uh, the armistice and the end of World War II. And so there's going to be like cards and stuff that you add to the deck and you kind of, kind of play through it and stuff. So uh, the Grizzled, of course, is very abstract in terms of a war game and kind of the experiences and sort of the mental uh, shock and everything that is involved with, you know, being in World War II, obviously. So then kind of layering on uh, that those kind of historical aspects and sort of grounding it in some kind of reality, I think will be very interesting. But I got to be honest with you, I'm going to throw these up on YouTube right now. Uh, but they have these crazy, amazing looking miniatures that are going to come pre-painted and they look just like the artwork and the art style by the late uh, Tignus. And he has done art through, you know, all of, of course, the original Grizzled and the expansion. And they've made these miniatures up with that sort of cartoony uh, caricature style. And they look just, I mean, they look amazing. They They really honestly gave me a pause and I kind of had to take a moment because you know Tignus has left this world um, and, and not in such a great way frankly and uh, just seeing his art kind of uh, you know take on a life of his own that whoever the sculpture was for these minis I frankly really did uh, paid reverence to I think that art style and it was just frankly moving just to see you know kind of his art come to life in three-dimensional form uh, it, I was fan fantastic. I, once you see these in person, uh, you know, take a look at them on, on the YouTube if you're watching there. But it was just amazing. I was just, man, I was just blown away by them. And then again, of course, all the gameplay parts of it, uh, the historical stuff all grounded in and tightly, uh, hopefully knitted to this abstract game should be very, very interesting to look at. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And then I apologize to anybody that's listening to this one. I just want to talk quickly and briefly about Munchkin Dungeon. No idea what this is about. It's a dungeon crawl set in the Munchkin universe. And it has the freaking cutest, silliest Munchkin 3D models I've seen. And I'm just going to put pictures of them up on YouTube. They're really cool. I mean, I really have no interest in a Munchkin Dungeon crawl, honestly. It's fine. I'm sure a lot of people will have a kick out of it. I don't really have any kind of vague interest, but then when I saw the way the models look, it's not like they look cool, they're badass, or there's like, you know, lots of detail, or you know what I mean? So they're just really cute looking. And I'm like, huh, that looks really neat. Like, I would like to have these and just look at them for a little while, and then I don't really need the game, but you can take it away from me now. <laughs> uh, but they just look really cool, so I'm excited to see. Hopefully the, day, the game is good, and the mechanics are good, and uh, it'll be a fun game. Because you just don't usually see... Uh, miniatures in this art style and I think that's cool I hope the game has some success in a kind of selfish way because a lot of times you see miniatures you know they'll kind of look a certain way they're kind of trying to achieve kind of a games workshop level of sort of that grimy brutal kind of you know high low fantasy kind of stuff you know kingdom death has their thing it's all very sort of aesthetically one way right it's this sort of uh I don't know what the right word is because I, I feel like there's adjectives coming to my head because I'm failing at language that aren't really going to do it right. But it's all like this 12-year-old comic book look, okay, or whatever. You don't really see cartoony minis. You know, you see some of the chibi stuff, but that's like its own thing. And you see some anime stuff. It's all kind of this, you know, basic things that things kind of fall into. But this is, uh, you know, maybe it's along the line of Arcadia Quest with this, but that's more of a chibi thing almost. I don't know. But this is, looks very munchkin-y, and they look very good. I think they look very cool, as well as they looking cute, you know? Um, so I'm just super excited about that. Anyway, enough about talking how things look on a podcast. <laughs> so that's the Munchkin board game. Excuse me, the Munchkin Dungeon board game. Uh, the next game that we got a nice overview for was Narcos the board game. Now, this is based on the uh, Netflix show that's in its third season. It's going to be going and doing a fourth season. And it's mostly about the drug trade in Colombia during the 80s and 90s when Pablo Escobar was in power for a little while and so on and after that. And it's an excellent TV show. My wife and I really have enjoyed uh, all the seasons of it so far. And this takes place as uh, various types of law enforcement are trying to hunt and find Pablo Escobar, who's a giant drug kingpin, and he's on the run. 
And while he's on the run, he's still trying to maintain and run his drug empire and do these kind of missions. So law enforcement is playing sort of Scotland Yard or Fury of Dracula or something like that. And Pablo Escobar, the one player, is trying to stay away from them and not get caught, but also doing kind of a worker placement kind of thing where they're doing missions and, you know, trying to still make money and keep their empire alive. And then I assume enact some kind of violence and stuff on other drug members. And Pablo was not a good guy. So he, I mean, he even killed innocent civilians. So I assume you're doing some of that kind of nastiness apart from just playing, you know, keep away and trying not to get caught. So that part of it actually is very interesting to me where you have kind of two asymmetric kind of games going on one you know player playing scotland yard the other playing you know worker placement so that is intriguing right by itself and since it's based on narcos which is based pretty closely to some of the history uh that's i think that'll be interesting i think it should be a lot of fun to play and kind of play around with some of that the dynamics between those two different gameplay styles so that is narcos so that was all I'm going to talk about at the CMON event uh, for right now. Like I said, I'll bring up another game in a little bit. But I wanted to talk about another game from CMON that I actually played somewhere else. We played a full game of Gizmos. And I believe this game might be even out right now, or it's coming out. And this is a weird little game. So you have this giant box, and it has marbles coming out of it. Think of, like, a potion explosion. But instead of, like, five lanes or whatever, there's just one lane of marbles that come out of this little dispenser. And you have this little board in front of you where you get these different cards. And you have, it's called gizmos, right? So you have like this uh, machine that you're sort of building. And you get these different cards and you take these actions like you can file cards away, you can build them, you can do an action to pick a marble out of the lane and that will maybe trigger some other stuff and those are different like electrical effects or something like that. And then you start to build up all of these combos where like, okay, I built this card and it's a black card. And whenever I build a black card, I can draw two marbles out of the little tray, and then I can go blindly dip my hand into that mechanism and draw two random marbles. But maybe every time I pull a yellow marble out of the little lane, then that allows me to pick two more random marbles. And then, But I have to build upgrades because you can only hold so many marbles at the same time. And then you can only build or maybe file away and squirrel away so many of these little devices at a time. So you build this kind of engine, 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 and then, you know, by the end of the the game, you're just doing huge, big old turns where you're pulling a bunch of marbles and building a bunch of stuff at the same time. I don't know. It's really neat. It's uh, it's very combo-y, and it's sort of uh, turns. I wouldn't say they drag on because it's just interesting to sit there and figure out how to make your engine efficient. But, like, as you add more little gizmos to your contraption, you start to sort of like just automatically do things that were costing you an arm and a leg at the beginning. So one of the players said that they thought it felt uh, very Splendor-like because, you know, in Splendor, you know, you're buying these cards with the chips, but after a while, you're just kind of like taking cards. It's only costing you one chip. And it has a similar kind of vibe here where you just are paying really cheaply for things and doing a lot more with your turn. So it was a lot of fun. It's, uh, you know, I'm not that excited about it because it just kind of, it just kind of was mechanics, you know, which is funny because that's the theme is like building these gizmos and these machines. But that's kind of all it really felt like it was. Uh, but we did play a full game of it. And uh, I definitely am on the positive. Somebody said, let's break it out and play it 100%. I would uh, feel like I could even be able to teach it because the mechanics are pretty straightforward. And, uh, and I'd certainly feel like I would have fun playing it. So moving on to some games that uh, I just had more of a demo of, I did get a chance to take a look at Vault of Dragons from Gale Force 9. This is coming out, I believe, in September. And if you played Sons of Anarchy from Gale Force 9 a couple of years ago, I think this will feel very familiar, and it feels like they have uh, certainly expanded on that design and sort of maybe improved upon it from what I could see. Now, the concept of the game is that you are sort of a lord and you're trying to send out these different uh, warriors and wizards and clerics and stuff like that to find uh, the secret vault. And you send them to different locations in town and you start to go into the dungeons and stuff. And you can actually have combat. And there's uh, seems like what could be an interesting combat mechanism where if your warrior is there fighting 
my rogue, for example, the warrior may roll a d8 and the warrior may roll a d4. I don't know if those are exactly right, but that is just an example. And so you say, okay, you're going to roll those and add it to your combat score. Well, how would a rogue ever beat somebody rolling a d8? Well, if you roll a 4 on a d4, that's going to crit. And there's going to be other little mitigating factors and mechanics in there as well, tokens and things you can get, re-rolls and all that. And so then you have sort of worker placement with combat, which was sort of an interesting thing about Sons of Anarchy. And all the locations are these cards, or they may actually be tiles in the in the final edition, but this demo was sort of cards. And when you activate locations and, and do things there, sometimes they'll flip over, and so they'll change. So they'll be... Uh, sort of a, a little bit of sort of like a persistent kind of arc over the course of a single game where you can do things and then that's going to affect and change uh, the board state and the game state and the state of the city as well as digging through the dungeon. As you go through the dungeon, certain things will happen and then eventually you're going to find uh, these secrets. So you're, you're going and digging through and there's little secret tokens that you can get and once you get enough of those, then you can reveal where the vault of the dragons is and then whoever does that gets the first shot and if they get it, they win. Uh, but then if they don't, if you're not quite prepared and you fail, then somebody else can come in on top of that. So I like that because the game is not going to be about victory points. It's not going to be, you know, about killing off the other player necessarily. It it feels like it's more bent toward narrative conclusion where it's like, okay, we're all looking for the dragon. We're trying to, you know, go through and manipulate everything through the seedy kind of town and go into dungeons, find it. Whoever gets it first wins. That's cool. I like the sound of that. So that's Vault of Dragons. And so I'm super interested in that. That should be about a month away. Uh, so that should be in store soon. The other thing that Gale Force 9 had that is a little bit further in the future, and they didn't really have a lot of information, uh, but I figured I'd share it because there's not a lot of information about it just yet at all, is their Aliens board game based on the Aliens movies. Now, this is going to be a co-op game. And it's going to have uh, imagery and all the IP from the second Aliens movies. And so players are going to be the Space Marines <laughs> that are, you know, landing on whatever the name of that planet is, LV-426 or whatever, and fighting aliens, which are controlled by uh, the AI. So I'll throw up some pictures of some of the cards and the imagery and the miniatures as I talk about this. But that was, frankly, all that they could really tell me was that it was going to be a co-op you know, it's going to have uh, all the IP out of that Aliens second movie. And it's going to have uh, nice, I think, looking plastic miniatures that you could certainly paint up. Uh, so it feels like it could be, uh, feels like it might have a Space Hulk kind of vibe, but it's not one versus one. It's going to be, although it could be. Um, but the AI, like I said, the Alien is controlled by the game. So it's going to be multiple players against the game and trying to, I assume, you know, do different objectives or just maybe it's more of a pandemic kind of thing where you set it up and you're just playing against sort of a card-driven AI or something like that. Uh, but not a lot of information, but it does look good. I, I did think the artwork and the components and the miniatures looked good. And Gale Force 9 has really done a good job with, you know, probably 80, 90% of the games. I've enjoyed them. Uh, so I am definitely looking forward to this Aliens cooperative survival game, I believe it's called. Now, moving on from Gale Force 9, I did get a chance to stop by the Cubicle 7 booth. Now, Cubicle 7 does role-playing games, and they had a printed-out uh, PDF of the Warhammer Fantasy 4th uh, Edition RPG, which is they're bringing back into life. I don't know how long it's been since 3rd Edition, but it's been a few years as far as I understand. So they're bringing that back. I had a chance to flip through that. Uh, that book look, looks fine. Uh, but I did have a chance to talk to one of the uh, lead developers of the Warhammer Age of Sigmar role-playing game, which is targeted to come out next year, hopefully about the same time. Uh, I can't really talk about what I what we talked about, because uh, he said is very much in development. Anything he told me was going to be kind of off the record. All I can tell you is the questions he did answer. <laughs> I enjoyed the answers. Um, I asked him a little bit about how, what kind of characters you could be, a little bit more about the setting and how it was all going to kind of work. And I'll just say that I thought the answers were good and it had me more interested in the game. Uh, I, you know, I asked him a little bit about, you know, is it going to be an old system or a new system based on Warhammer Fantasy? And so, but he just asked that I, you know, was off the record and not to repeat anything because it was all very much in development. So they don't want to be held to, you know, anything that I might say and maybe they find out they got to change it in six months on that kind of thing. But he said they were on good pace 
Uh, he felt like they they were confident it should come out next year in 2019. Um, I got the sense that it would be towards the end of the year. So maybe it's Q3 next year. Maybe it's Q4. I mean, who knows? It could slip into 2020. I mean, it, game development takes time. But as somebody that's interested in this, in the Age of Sigmar universe over the Warhammer Fantasy universe, which is dead and gone, um, you know, I was excited by what I heard. So that's all I got to say about that. Just I don't, That's not really information, but I'm excited about it. And so moving on from there, I did get a chance to check out some stuff from Fantasy Flight. Uh, I did get a chance to play a couple of games of Keyforge, which was kind of their big announcement. I will talk more about that later, uh, because like I said, I did play some full games of it. I did also, though, before we get to that, look at the new Game of Thrones Mother of Dragons expansion. And I am super excited about this. Uh, we try to play the Game of Thrones board game about once a year, although I think it's been longer than a year at this point. I'm not, no, 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 that's 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 a lie. We played it a few months ago. That's my bad. Um, so yeah, so we try to play about once a year. And this expansion is going to take it up, I believe, to eight players. There's at least going to be now eight factions instead of six factions. There's going to be House Aaron, which is a proper faction that you can do now, not... Uh, playing as another faction like you can with some of the expansions. There's also going to be a Targaryen faction. Uh, so Khaleesi and all her friends are going to be involved, and then she's going to have dragons. So you're going to have three dragons that are going to grow in power over the course of the game, because obviously in the show they start, out of, they start out as babies, and then, spoiler, they get older and bigger, and then you can be able, they'll get stronger as the game, course of the game goes by. And there's also going to be mechanics there to... I don't remember quite uh, what they called the name of this, but it was almost like Whispers. So the Targaryens can start to sort of uh, sow the seeds of uh, disruption over back on Westeros. And there'll be a new map of Essos as well, another board off to the side that you can add. And the Targaryens obviously will start there. And But there's some new mechanics as well. There's like a Bank of Bravos mechanics. So if you're familiar with the show or the books, you'll kind of get what this means. But you can sort of take out a loan in a way. You can get some kind of bonus. And then you get the card and say, okay, I want that bonus. Maybe give me some extra resources or whatever. Then you flip the card over. And then it shows you what you got to pay in interest. And I don't know if it's a round-by-round round thing or you've got a couple of turns to pay it. But usually it'll be in power. You know, you have the little power tokens. But you won't know what that interest is going to be and i assume they'll have multiple copies of the card so you can't memorize them but uh, so you're gonna you can take out like a loan from the bank of bravo so to speak and then flip it over and be like oh no <laughs> now i have to come up with two power or something every turn or something like that so that's interesting there's a new card deck added to the westeros deck which has to deal with more of the targaryen type of thing and that's if you remember from the game that's when the wildlings kind of come across i'm curious if there'll be some uh some of the White Walker stuff that's in there because that's kind of come, uh, you know, into more uh, relevance in the show and stuff. So I'm very, very interested in how all of this is going to work together. Now, the one key thing for me is I was told that there would be a lot of new mechanics uh, for playing with less than six players. And what's called what's what it's called is a vassal. Now, not like Tom Vassal. It's a V A S S A L where you can take on and control in some degree or in various different ways, different houses. So let's say you're playing a four player game and you're the Lannisters and the Starks aren't being used by anybody. Well, then you can sort of take control of their house and get them to do your bidding. Uh, not that that would ever happen, <laughs> but in the course of this game, it could happen and you get to maybe go fight something for you or use them as an ally and that kind of thing. So it feels like the board's still gonna be relatively full and in use, but you'll have different mechanics to sort of balance the fact that there's not six heads sitting at the table. And he also mentioned something about players being able to drop in and drop out. So if you were playing for a long game and then whoever's playing, I don't know, House Aaron has to leave, then they just kind of convert to uh, a bot house that players can manipulate to some degree. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds amazing. Because then, you know, you would be able just to play a game. And, you know, Game of Thrones can take some time. We've had games go four hours or so. And so that's a nice little element there. If somebody gets sick of it, then, okay, no big deal. You can go home. And then uh, we're all going to take control over this house and manipulate you. But you're not going to win because you had to leave. <laughs> so there you go. So that was the Game of Thrones Mother of Dragons. Uh, sticking with Fantasy Flight for a couple more things. 
On the YouTube channel, I'll be throwing up pictures of this giant super star destroyer that's going to sell for 200 bucks. The thing is massive, and I feel like if I owned it, I would break it. Uh, but I put some pictures up on the YouTube because you can see the scale of the thing. It's just it's huge. It's gigantic. Um, I don't play Armada or anything. I should have said this is for Star Wars Armada. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's neat that it exists. I like that. It's a big old giant Super Star Destroyer. I don't know how you play with it. I don't know how you move it around. I feel like it would have some detrimental impact on the play space. I believe it's played on a 6x3 foot uh, play space Star Wars Armada. And this would probably take up uh, the whole three foot across. <laughs> it's as big. Uh, so it'd be interesting. Maybe it'll be used for more narrative games. I also had a chance to demo the new Arkham Horror, the third edition of Arkham Horror. Uh, and it was good. I liked it. It was an interesting uh, type of design. You'll see some of these uh, hexagonal sort of uh, connector pieces so the board can be sort of randomized and changed up or maybe explored and revealed as you go through. Uh, we played through what was kind of a demo scenario. was a couple of rounds. And it worked. It, it reminded me of a lot of elements out of Arkham Horror and a lot of elements out of Eldritch Horror. And uh, there was even a little bit that reminded me of the LCG. So it feels like they have revisited the design and kind of updated it, made it more modern, less clunky, and no, all that kind of stuff. Maybe a little bit more accessible. Uh, but there's certainly not like the overwhelming amount of stuff that's going on in Arkham Horror 2nd Edition and even in Eldritch Horror, especially when you add all the expansions in Eldritch Horror. So it looked good. I mean, honestly, it looked like I have Eldritch Horror and a bunch of the expansions and I've played with most of the expansions I have at this point. And I like it. I still have it in my collection, obviously. But yeah, this looked good, but it's like I already have Eldritch Horror, you know? <laughs> like, it's fine. I like Eldritch Horror. It does the thing. You walk around and crazy things happen. And you have to level up your guys and do all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I don't know. It looks good. I'm just not that excited about it because it's another Arkham game. So I apologize for my lack of excitement, <laughs> but I do not think the game looks terrible at all. Uh, the other thing I checked out at the Fantasy Flight booth was I got a quick, very, very brief overview of Heroes of Terranoth. And this is by Adam and Brady Sadler. And they also designed uh, one of my favorite games, actually, is the Warhammer Quest adventure card game, which came out a few years ago uh, and is no longer being printed. And Heroes of Terranoth uses... Uh, very similar mechanics to uh, that game, and, but of course it's set in the Terranoth universe, which is the Runebound or RuneQuest uh, universe. And uh, so the, here's the changes that I think are the key highlights is there's no campaign system in the base game. Now in Warhammer Quest card game, you had a campaign, I think of five quests that you went through, and there was like a delve mode, which made it play kind of like a roguelike on the PC. And that I love the delve mode and that. But this is just, I think, eight quests that are just all one-shots. And your characters will level up uh, mid-quest, right? So you can gain one, two levels uh, within a single quest. So there's no campaign or persistence that needs to happen. And there's a lot of variety, though, in the cards and things that you can get. And you can level up your characters in multiple ways this time right out of the gate. So you have a mage, let's say, and I don't, I'm making these words up as I go. You have a mage who could become a wizard or a sorcerer, let's say. Totally making this up. But you can do that. There's cards for all that. And I think, gosh, I don't remember the exact number, but there's definitely multiple paths that each of the kind of the base classes can go. And then as you level up, you kind of pick and choose uh, which sort of tree you want to go down. And you go down that tree and you play it that way. So you can play the same scenario again, even with the same base class, and you go down another tree and fight that stuff. And there's certainly been some uh, tweaks and stuff to the way that you explore and the whole kind of exploration step. So I, I do have some interest in this because I, you know, I enjoy the Warhammer universe and all that kind of stuff too. But I really like the Warhammer Quest, uh, the card game, and I like the delve mode especially, uh, just because you kind of I feel like I was playing a roguelike, like I said. Uh, but I I definitely have some interest in Heroes of Tyranoth because I really do enjoy the system above uh, just about anything in that game. And so I'd be curious to see how this works and I still kind of frankly favored the Warhammer Quest card game over the Arkham LCG and there's certainly some similar elements uh, between that and even the Lord of the Rings LCG and stuff uh, but I really like the Warhammer Quest one just for it's kind of get in and get out and I think this will still have that like I don't have to play a campaign of a dang card game I can just get in and play play this one play that one kind of weave the story together in my head no big deal and I kind of like that and so I, I definitely feel like there is going to be expansions uh, coming out 
that maybe we'll do a campaign. So maybe they will gear it towards more of the Arkham LCG thing. And that was one thing that I've really enjoyed sort of seeing, even though I never went past the base game of Arkham LCG. I sort of liked that you could have a story and that it would continue and, and, and follow up. Uh, you could follow up with it and you could play it, you know, in a burst, get an expansion, play it in a burst, you know, wait a couple of months and there'd be a new expansion. You could kind of continue the story in these sort of uh, easily digestible uh, bite size pieces. And I have a suspicion, this is just me supposing, that they will do something kind of interesting with that, uh, with this Heroes of Tyrannoth game, because there is uh, eight quests that are in the game. So I'm wondering if, okay, those are just kind of the eight starting quests, and maybe you can fork the expansion based on that. That's just kind of totally wishful pipe dream thinking. <laughs> but I think they, they have opportunity here to do something, I think, a little bit unique uh, in terms of how they approach a campaign like that. And uh, speaking of Fantasy Flight, I think for the last time until we talk about Keyforge, I did get a chance to demo the Lord of the Rings LCG, but the digital card game. So this is uh, done by Asmode Digital, and it's obviously based on the Lord of the Rings LCG. And I have some terrible screenshots that I'm putting up on YouTube, but if you're missing out on that, don't worry. I just wanted some shots of the interface. It felt very Hearthstone-y, and I, all I mean is that the way that you sort of interact with the cards and the characters and stuff was very intuitive and very easy and all of the kind of on-screen prompts and everything uh, were very familiar especially if you've played Hearthstone I think even if you haven't played Hearthstone it's presented in such a way that you'd be able to jump right in and I was able to kind of uh, and I I'd, I'd played the LCG before but it's been a while and I was able to just kind of jump right in there without much uh, guidance from uh, the fellow that was demoing it for me and it was cool it was neat. There's some changes to the mechanics uh, in the digital game versus the LCG, but it's pretty close. Uh, the big change was instead of like the players doing all the actions and then the monsters all activating, it's, an, it's a back and forth alternating activation thing. So I'll, maybe I'll activate uh, Gandalf and then the monster will do something and then I'll activate Frodo and then it goes back and forth, back and forth. So that's a big change. But the threat level and the resource building and all that kind of stuff, that's all the same. Uh, so And it's going to be free to play, so I'll certainly be pulling it down. It's going to be out on Steam first, and then eventually maybe down the road it'll be on iOS and Android. Uh, but it's going to be on Steam, and then they'll have DLC and stuff that you can pay for, for extra quest packs and all that kind of funny business. But hey, it's going to be free, so certainly you can check it out and try it. And I think he said... Gosh, I don't remember the exact date. It was like August 28th or 23rd or something. It's definitely coming out at the end of August, though. So certainly if you got Steam, uh, take a look at it on your PC. So jumping ahead in time, because <laughs> I've got some stuff I want to really talk about at the end, I did get a chance to play a full game of Cryptid, and this is from Osprey Games. This game's really weird, but I really liked it. And I just had a chance to play the one game, and so my mind's definitely not made up, but I'm definitely intrigued uh, by this. Uh, it looks like, well, frankly, it looks like Tobago, uh, but it's got some more, I think, variability and stuff built in. I played Tobago one time a long time ago, uh, but the board looks like Kingdom Builder, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but what, what happens is, is you draw a card, or even actually you can go to a website, and it tells you a certain way to arrange these big hexagonal tile board things. So you arrange it in a very specific way, and then it will generate for you a single location on one of those hexes where the uh, monster that you're searching for can be. And then it'll give each player, you tell it how many number of players you're playing, so you look at the card or the website, and it'll say, okay, your clue is this. And then Billy will get this other clue, and Francesca will get this other clue. And then you just make a, uh, a set of actions that are asking each other, okay, uh, you'll put a little uh, pawn on a spot and say, Billy, could this location satisfy your clue? And they say yes or no. If they say no, they put a cube out. And then you have to put a cube out. If anybody ever says no to anything, any question you ask them, you also have to put a cube out ruling out one of the locations for your clue. And the board is organized in such a way that only one of the locations can be the exact right spot. And it'll be like, uh, is your you don't even have to ask them you just point to the spot but it'll say hey is your thing within one space of a mountain space or is it within two spaces of a cougar and it give you a list of possible sort of clues and questions that people will get 
you never have to verbally ask it out loud. You just point to a spot and you have this little like booklet that you're looking at. And you say, okay, it's not that. So that means it can never be any of these other spaces and da da da. So you kind of just grind it down to a space and then you, you know, whoever picks the first space uh, is the winner. Or not the first space, but the, the, the only space. And it was really fun. I played with two complete strangers. Uh, a guy there at the Osprey booth was uh, telling us how it worked and everything and taught us how to play. And it was a blast. We all had a really good time. And we were all laughing about it and about how we thought it was one thing and then it was the other and eventually we got it. Uh, but it was really neat. I was very surprised. It's, it's a deduction game, and but it's just a very different kind of deduction game, I think. And it's got a lot of replayability and setup. And it's even got like little modes you can play an advanced game because you could get very sort of opaque about you know how specific the clues are going to be. You can even do sort of uh, double, not double negative, but anti-clues. Instead of like, is your thing within one space of a mountain? Is your thing not within one space of a mountain? So you can kind of like sort of stretch your deductive thinking. Or you can, you know, you can play a very straightforward, more basic idea. So I like that it's got that kind of built-in uh, stuff in the box. So that was Cryptid from Osprey. And the next game, uh, it's called Mezzo. This is coming from Colossal Games. Now this is designed by John Cloudus, who did Omen uh, Reign of War, which if you watch the channel for probably a very long time, you'd know that it's one of my favorite games. I still got the Omega edition sitting up on my shelf there. Uh, and he's designed a whole bunch of other games. He has a publishing house of his own called Small Box Games, but he started to work more closely now with Colossal Games. And this is by far, I think, the largest sort of game uh, that John Cloudus has designed. And this is coming to Kickstarter. You're going to be seeing prototype pictures up on the YouTube. Uh, but this is sort of a dudes on the map uh, controlling giant gods. So think of like a Blood Rage or Rising Sun kind of thing, even though the mechanics are totally different. And this is set in kind of a South American kind of uh, vibe, very very fantasy uh, driven though. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting mechanics in this one. Uh, I don't want to bog too much down it, but there's some very interesting sort of card play and you have a, you sort of draw cards and then choose one and you have to do some worker placement so there's some choices even bundled in and packed in more tightly in on each card uh, there's some movement of the gods uh, that you can move around so you can only kind of a, normally affect uh, regions where the god is sort of touching uh, so that's kind of an interesting positional kind of thing and there's some other kind of very i felt very thematic kinds of things uh, that went into this game here and uh, so it felt very sort of I want to say, I mean, only, we only played for about a third or so of the game, but it felt actually more in touch with its theme. God, I really hesitate saying this, but I, I did get a very strong impression of this. More in touch with its theme than Rising Sun or Blood Rage. Uh, it, there were certain little wrinkles and, and very specific mechanics about the way you used warriors and priests, and there was sort of a, a hell or a Hades. I don't remember. It's a it's a it's an old word, you know, strange old word from uh, you know long ago. Uh, I don't remember what it said, but it has this this weird aspect with sort of this afterlife and bringing people back and building these the different pyramids and things. Uh, so it was cool. It had a lot of those kind of little nooks and crannies on top of a, of a pretty uh, solid kind of straightforward core system that looked really cool. Now this is coming on Kickstarter, I think in August. So you can see a lot more about it, I think when it comes out. But that was Mezzo from Colossal Games. Okay, we got two more. And then we're gonna get to like really awesome, excited stuff that I played a full game of or multiple games of. So the next one is the District 9 uh, coming from Weta Workshop and Cryptozoic. Now, uh, Weta Workshop did Giant Killer Robots, which I did a Kickstarter preview for, I think, about a year ago. And that game is really super fun and amazing, and the miniatures are crazy. And definitely go check a look, take a look at that video or take a look at that game because it's a lot of fun. Now, they, uh, they've they actually worked on, I believe, District 9, the movie. And so they're working on now District 9, the board game, and I didn't even know this thing existed until I walked by their booth and I was like, what, what's this? <laughs> District 9, huh? Sweet. And so the game looks interesting. The miniatures and stuff look pretty cool. And you have the quote-unquote prawns, you know, the alien race that sort of live in this sort of wasteland of a, of a board. And then players are going to take on the roles of different uh, kind of factions. So you can be a gang. You can be sort of a more... Uh, militant and insurgent prawn organization 
and then you can also be the of what they call the M MNU. I can't remember whatever the police force was. And then there's kind of another faction that you can take on. So you're mostly kind of fighting with each other and you're going out and like getting, collecting technology from them and trying to advance your own kind of uh, interests. Uh, but, uh, and there's always going to be these sort of uh, neutral prawns that are out on the board that are at the beginning, relatively not anti you and they're not pro you. And depending on how you treat them, is going to sort of swing the balance in the game. So if you go in and just start killing them, they're not, at first they're not going to do anything. But if you keep doing it, it's going to have some consequences. Whereas if you just kind of let them go, that's going to have different consequences. So it was just a very quick, uh, brief overview. But I was intrigued by it because it seemed like a sort of a unique take on it. You're not just running around killing these innocent aliens that happen to crash on Earth. Uh, you know, you've got to interact with them in different ways. And then meanwhile, you have these other people in there, but you're still trying to exploit them for their technology and steal their technology to a degree. Uh, so you're not altogether a great person. Unless, of course, you maybe you play the sort of uh, more, um, let's say, more involved uh, prawn faction that is trying to do something, you know, who knows what their goal is. Uh, so it seems cool. And, you know, What a Workshop did a really cool, interesting uh, thing with... Uh, giant killer robots so i'm i'm interested in this and how this is going to work so anyway that's district nine i don't know what the story is for that it's being it's in development uh, i feel like they're going to do a kickstarter so we're going to see some more news i think coming down the road here uh so the last one of these uh, that i got to play most of a full game uh jerry hawthorne the designer and my friend jonathan and i we sat down and we got to play i think most of a game of coma knots and this is from plat hat games and this is coming out in December. Now, Coma Knots, that's C O M A N A U T S, like astronauts, it's Coma Knots. And what you're doing, this is a really awesome premise. So it's it's what you call like an adventure book game. So if you played Stuffed Fables, this is sort of a second edition of that, or it's not really related to it, but it has that mechanically, uh, you know, it's tied to that where you, you kind of flip through an adventure book, you're taking your actions on a map on the book page, and then you have some interesting kind of dice selection kind of things that happen. But the story of this is there was a genius, kind of a scientist, and he had built some device that was going to solve all the world's energy problems. And But he had uh, the device malfunctioned. And some of this is from memory, so if I get the specific story wrong, forgive me. But the device malfunctioned now, he's in a coma, and the device is kind of melting down and actually going to destroy the earth instead of save it. And he's in a coma and you're try your job is to get him out of the coma. And you guys are coma knots. And this is in the future. So there's some new technology that allows you to sort of sync with somebody's brain patterns if they're in a coma. Now, the trick of it is, is you're not like a specialist or a scientist or something that's like a, a you're not like a professional coma knot. Because they found with this technology that certain people's brain waves are more attuned to others than they would be other people. So they found you and your friends who have come uh, to play this game and you happen to be in tune with this particular scientist's uh, brain pattern. So you've been asked to help uh, you know, get him out of this coma. And you've got to basically go into this guy's psyche, his childhood memories, and all these different sort of aspects of his personality uh, to, to wake him up because you need to save the world. And I was reading into so many different layers of allegory when we were playing that first scenario um, that, frankly, I was, like, already moved. Like, playing this the first 15 minutes of the game, I'm like, oh, this is the game that I've been thinking about, you know, that I didn't even know existed that's going to just, you know, touch on different aspects of my own psyche uh, and everything and just those different aspects of play that, you know, I often get on the podcast and talk about. And I'm like, this is, this feels good. I like how this feels. It gives me a warm, you know, feeling inside playing it. Um, and it's got some very, you know, really interesting kind of basic mechanics. And, and it, it looks like it has some decent uh, replayability. Um, so you have sort of what's called, oh gosh, I can't remember what he called it. So you have to sort of figure out sort of the, the pain point. I'm just going to say that. That's not what he called it. But there's a pain point that you have to get at and succeed and sort of help fix. It almost feels like an Inception in a point. If you ever saw the Inception movie, you've got to kind of dig through these layers of psyche. You know the one that you're after isn't the very first one. 
it isn't the very first scenario that you're going to start with. So before you play, you're going to shuffle these up and dig it out and then stick one aside, uh, kind of like you do with Clue or something where you take out you know, the cards and you set them aside. You don't know what it is, but you're sort of through a process of elimination, start to get after uh, you know what his sort of main issue is. So there's going to be some replayability. There's going to be a lot of different scenarios. There's going to be sort of mechanics and sort of uh, he called them like almost like little mini games that'll change and and play in different ways as you go through the book. Uh, but it's going to be touch on some uh, you know very like adult subjects. Um, so it's almost like the adult version of stuffed fables. Um, so I'm super excited about this one. It's coming out in December. Uh, I think there's going to be. I think this will be a lot of interesting things that are going to happen. I, I, I hope it kind of lives up to sort of the hype I'm building up in my own head about it. Uh, but that's Komonauts, and you'll definitely see something for me uh, about that at some point. Okay, so that's kind of the general stuff. This is going to be a little bit longer than I was hoping, but that's okay. It's, just, it's Gen Con, right? <laughs> so we can go a little bit long. Uh, so now we're going to get to stuff that I played multiple times and, and or maybe only played it once in some degree, but I'm just like, yes, this one's good. I recommend this one, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so first one is Keyforge, and that's from Fantasy Flight Games. And it's so funny because when they announced this game, it, it was this weird transition for myself, and I felt like for the people around me and maybe in generally at everybody at the convention, when they first announced it, and I'll explain what it is in a minute if you haven't heard of it, it was like, what is this crap? This is the dumbest thing ever. Oh, wait, this seems neat. Okay, I kind of get it. Oh, oh, whoa, this is neat. I like this. This is awesome. I need this game. Like, the transition of that thought process. Frankly, I'm projecting a little bit because that's what happened inside me. But I saw it. I witnessed it happen to other people. And so it just generally felt like there was this sort of wave and shift of enthusiasm to like, that's dumb, to this is awesome, this is a genius idea. So what is it? Well, Keyforge is a card game uh, designed by Richard Garriott, who designed Magic the Gathering, King of Tokyo, and other games. And what it is, it's sort of a collectible card game, but there's not really any collecting. Because if you get the starter set, you get the starter set. That's it. But then if after that, you buy a pack and you get it and that's your deck you buy the pack it's 37 cards that's your deck you don't change it each deck that anybody ever buys is going to have a unique name and unique artwork on the card back it's also going to come with like a little deck list and that's going to tell you what's in the deck and then you're you never change it you never 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 change it so you get a deck and that's it you can go buy another deck if you want and they're 10 bucks a piece so, you know, maybe you get online discount, $8.50, whatever, 10 bucks. And then you open the deck and your friend gets the deck and he pays 10 bucks or she pays 10 bucks. And then you play the game and maybe you play it again and you play it again. And you go, well, okay, well, I don't get to customize my deck. What if my friend gets a better deck than me and beats me up? Yeah, it could happen. But there's mechanics in the game to sort of uh, balance out decks. If your friend is beating you in a deck and you're playing, let's say we best play best two out of three, they will get these little sort of hindrances called chains, which allow them to actually draw less cards at the end of their turn. Anyway, I don't want to get into that nonsense. But here's the thing. We played two two games with two decks. I had two. My friend Rodney picked, uh, grabbed a couple of decks for me, and uh, we played some couple of games. I played some games with Rodney, and then also uh, Marty uh, from Long Dice Take Names from my, my other friend there. And, uh, yeah, the game's super fun. <laughs> it has a lot of mechanics, a lot of keywords and stuff. And you got to download, right now you got to download the rules and get them, but I'm sure when the starter set comes out, they'll have all the rules in there. So it's a little bit, it was a little bit hard to learn for us because we had to, like, look on our phones and go through the PDF as we were trying to learn the game. And there's a lot of different keywords and functions and factions and all this kind of interactions that you had to get used to. Like, it's not very, it's not super simple right out the gate. Uh, but it kind of should be. And I think one, if people get the starter set, that'll be a little bit better of an introduction. But what happens is you get a deck, and it's going to have cards from three different factions. I believe there's seven total factions in the game. And you you have three different factions worth of cards. And the one thing I forgot to mention is that each deck is completely, totally unique. If I buy a deck of cards, and that's my deck, no one ever in the history of the world will buy a duplicate deck. 
Now there may be some decks that are closer in you know card count and everything and the different cards that are in there than others. Um, and certainly I saw cards in my friends' decks that they had that was in my decks, but our decks can play completely differently. But what your turn consists of is you choose one of those three factions that are in the deck. You say, I'm going to play cards from, let's call it the egg faction. So that turn, you can only play cards that have the egg faction. You can only discard cards that have the egg faction. You can only attack with cards and activate cards with the egg faction. And then at the end of your turn, usually you're going to draw back up to six cards. On your next turn, you might play with, let's call it the purple ruby faction. And then you would just only interact with cards like that. Now, sometimes there'll be little, you know, special effects on the cards that says, hey, even though you're chosen other faction, you can use me this turn, stuff like that. Uh, and then what you're trying to do is generate this sort of amber dust to unlock these three keys. And then you uh, you need to collect six amber, and then you can take an action at the start of your turn. If you have six amber, amber at the start of your turn, you can unlock a key. You spend the six amber, and then you do that two more times, and then you win. Uh, but you can sort of smack other creatures that are doing that. And typically, the function of a creature, once you get it out into play, is to reap. And when you reap, you generate an amber, although you can get amber from different effects. So there's no, like, life points or anything. But there's ways to, like, steal amber and stuff like that, move it around. Sometimes you put amber on a creature. So there's, like, a lot of different things going on, like I said. So it's nice. it would be nice to have a full rule book, which we'll get with the starter. But, yeah, after I played each of the decks, I was like, okay... I need to play this deck again because I was immediately felt like I could have played it better because of the synergies and stuff. I thought, oh, okay, this, if I'd have done this and got a bunch of creatures and then kind of maybe sh uh, fished out to try to draw some things that activated it once I have a bunch of creatures in play or this other one where I can do this thing that's called archiving where you can kind of stuff stuff, uh, stuff things aside in a special pile and then you can just go bam and you pull them all into your hand. You can have like, I'm exaggerating. 30 cards of all the same faction just have a huge massive turn but you can build to that you can sort of play the deck to that once i realized that the deck did that i was like okay well now i know what the deck can do or should do then i can play it better and so i thought that was neat so if i'm going to pay 10 bucks and get a deck that i can play i don't know five times 10 times and get better and better and better and better at it and as i learn kind of the meta of the cards that exist you know within the giant pool of cards that's pretty neat i like that that seems like it allows for some creative play, potentially. I think certainly you're going to have some decks that are like, uh, that's the best deck in the world. And whoever has that, guess what? He's going to be the only person in the world that has it. <laughs> so you don't have to play him. <laughs> you can just go play your friend who has like the 400th best deck in the world. So I think there's not going to be a lot of gnashing of teeth. Because frankly, here, look at this situation. Me and Billy have the decks. Okay, well, let's say we each buy five decks. Billy gets an amazing deck. He beats me every time. Now, I mentioned there's a chain uh, mechanic that will sort of uh, uh, make his deck weaker, sort of as a handicap. So if you're playing like in a tournament situation or you're playing like best out of three or best out of five, if he keeps winning, he's going to start to accrue chains to sort of self-handicap. And that can even happen actually in the game. There's certain cards that are like, you do this awesome thing, then you need to take a chain which is going to make you start drawing less cards. So some one of the, my first deck was kind of built around that. I was like, "Geez, I'm just smashing down with this." But I was just it was just making me weaker and weaker as I was using it. So it has that kind of concept built in. But here's the other part of that. If he's got such a good deck that he just keeps winning like five times in a row until he has five chains on him, which that would be crazy, but uh you know what, Billy, put that deck away. <laughs> Go play this other deck. And then we're going to play a real game. So easy problem solved never play that deck again get the deck out of my face we're going to play these other 40 decks that work fine okay i think it's going to work i'm fan i love this idea and i think the great thing is uh and this is something a lot of us talked about was okay is this going to replace magic the gathering is this going to replace you know netrunner or whatever no but you can play this right alongside whatever games you feel like playing if you're not into collectible card games, because why? You don't like buying booster packs. You don't like chasing LCG expansions every other month. Perfect. You could buy a new Keyforge deck every three months for 10 bucks, and then you and your buddies can sit around and play Keyforge for a weekend. Easy. You could go to a tournament, and you could have eight people. Everybody chips in 10 bucks, 
You play like a sealed deck tournament. Everybody opens their key forks thing. You're not allowed to look at the cards. No looking. Round one pairings, you and Billy go. Francesca and Nancy, you go. And then you just play. You can't look at your decks. And then you just got to play as you do. But as the uh, day goes on, like say you do it on a Saturday, as you move into the fourth and fifth round, then you're going to know your decks. You're going to be fine-tuned and well-oiled. And you're going to be uh, you're going to be knocking it out of the park. I don't know. That sounds super exciting to me. I love the concept. So that's Keyforge. That's all I got to say about that one. So the next game, I only had a chance to play this one once, but in theory, I've played it several times in my past, and that's the new edition of Brass. Now we played Brass Lancashire, which is the sort of twin game of of another one, and I'm totally spacing out on the name. <laughs> anyway, there's two editions of Brass that have just come out from Roxley Games. And one is Lancashire, which is mostly like the old brass. And there's a new one with an entirely new map and some other new mechanics, like you ship beer, which you didn't do in the original, and stuff like that. So we played Lancashire. Now, there are some changes to Lancashire. And there's actually a double-sided map. So if you want to play with different maps and a little bit different set of cards, then you can. So there's some variation there. It's also been designed to scale much better for two, three, and four players. Now, I played it two players. And, oh, it's Brass Birmingham. It just came into my head. So I was playing with uh, Rodney Smith of Watch It Played, and he has been, uh, he's, he's played Brass Birmingham uh, just the other day. And so he was somewhat familiar with Brass, and I had played, of course, the old one. And so we worked through it, and there's just a couple of minor changes with the, the board uh, layout and the number of cards and stuff. And I think, I feel like there's another change I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but it's very, very, very minor. Um, but guess what? Brass works with two players now. And they also include the BGG variant, which I never played back in the day. Uh, you know That two-player variant, if you want to play that. But this is a new, specially designed, uh, you customize the deck of cards, and it works a little bit differently with in terms of the, uh, the way the rounds end and so on. But uh, And the map is smaller with two players. But it worked. It was very, very good. We had a very nice game of it. It was very much still uh, some definite layers of interaction because uh, in brass you kind of it's like card driven economic uh, delivery game. It's really weird, uh, but it's cool. It's really good mechanics. And it's very obtuse and very hard to penetrate when you first play it. It's very hard to figure out what am I supposed to do. Mechanics are not too difficult. There's some weird kind of rules exceptions, uh, but it's good. I highly recommend the game, uh, 100%. And I know that the Birmingham one, it makes some even more drastic changes uh, to kind of the core brass. But I was very curious about how what they changed for Lancashire, because I've always enjoyed that. And I, frankly, I've always been more of an Age of Industry fan because there's other maps and things, and there's other little rules and things that they add based on the map uh, that you can uh, you know, add some replayability. It's not very static, because that was the problem with kind of brass. is like, okay, this is fine after like the fifth, whatever, tenth time. I don't know, for, different for everybody. But... Okay, it's the same thing. You know, my hand of cards is different, but I know basically I want to build here and ship here in the first couple of turns, and then, oh, it's a good time to throw an ironwork down because this is a good time and all that stuff. And I know I'm kind of, if you have not played Brass, I know I'm probably not making a lot of sense, but this was good. This was amazing. It looks gorgeous. The old Brass, even the old Adif industry, they look like dang prototypes. And this looks like, oh, the board's and the components and the cards and the artwork and everything this looks amazing it just looks absolutely gorgeous uh so i can't wait i'm gonna try to track down a copy of both of these editions and get some a lot of more plays in and i'd love to do a review of this one uh for sure uh just because i think it's uh you know it's a worthwhile game i think uh, having either edition now obviously lancashire or birmingham i don't feel like you need to get both really although it would be nice uh, you know, to have that variety, I don't think you need to jump in and get both right away. Just pick one or the other, and then you'll be good to go. Um, but it's just really just elevated the game. I think because it looks nice now, maybe I can get it played more in that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I was just really blown away by the love and care and the art and all that. But yeah, the, even the little tweaks to the mechanics and stuff that they did, uh, just really amazing. If you like Euros, and like card driven games like let's say you're a twilight struggle fan i think you'd like brass you know if you like some of those card driven war games uh, i think you know it's got that that just that extra layer of rules complexity there to keep things very very interesting and not not always as straightforward as sometimes uh, a euro game can be 
it's got that little extra layer of nuance and stuff to go oh i see this is a little different than i expect you know it's not right on the paper right on the cover there anyway so that's brass enough talk about brass uh, the next game is another sort of old game, but it's new again. And this is called Yellow and Yangtze. And this is uh, from Reiner Knizia. And it's sort of like Tigers and Euphrates 2.0. Uh, so again, if you've not played Tigers and Euphrates, I apologize. Uh, but I had a chance to play this a couple of times. I played a three-player and four-player. I don't think it would be that fun two-player, but I'd have to give it a shot. I never really liked Tigers with two-player anyway. It's really a three- and a four-player game. Uh... It's, it's podcast, so I don't want to mire in mechanics. There are some definite mechanical changes. So instead of squares, it's uh, hexagon tiles. It has these pagodas that are instead of monuments. It has some different actions that you can do. Uh, so if one example is you can't uh, decimate and destroy with the uh, catastrophe tile. You don't get catastrophe tiles, but you can discard two blue tiles to do the same thing. But that's that's not the whole story. But again, I don't want to jump into all the mechanics. But I, I kept telling people this, and I'm afraid to say this on the podcast that'll go on the internet. But after I played it a couple times, I was like, huh, I don't know. Tiger's and Freddy's is like my third or fourth favorite game. I think I like this better. I don't know. I don't want to say that out loud. <laughs> because I don't want people to be mad at me. <laughs> But uh, I think it's, uh, I think it might be better. I don't know, man. Like, it's good. Like, I was very relieved when I played it to say, I can confidently say it's a good game. And it's, it has a deserving spot in the collection. If you don't have Tigris in your collection and you wanted to give this one a shot first, yes, do it. As far as which is a better game, eh, I don't know. That's going to take several plays, honestly, because there's more you can do with the tiles in this game than you could in Tigris. But is that better or is it just different? I don't know, man. I really don't know. <laughs> but there was just a lot of cool stuff. So even if you have Tigris and you're a fan, I think if you come out with the attitude of like, it doesn't have to be better or worse, which is a friggin' amazing attitude to have in life, especially about games. If you could just come out of like, okay, this is different. It's like Tigris, but it's different. I think it's good, regardless if it's better or worse or whatever than Tigris. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? It's different. It's like a little expansion. That's just a whole new game. <laughs> so I, I loved it. Frankly, I just loved it. I loved every second of that game. I, like I said, I played it twice. I was rare. I could have played it five more times. That's how much I wanted to play it. Just to see like so much, like so much comes out of that game that's like different every play and decisions and stuff that just come out. It's a super abstract game. Uh, but man, I recommend this so much to people if you can find it. Uh, so that's Yellow and Yanksy. I know that's not very clear and concrete. This is another one I'd love to do a video review and kind of walk through it. Because then I can I can kind of lay out the mechanics for you in visual detail and say this, this you know, you do this, 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 and then just spin up and talk about all that. Okay, a couple of more. Uh, Shadows Amsterdam. This is coming from Asmodee. Now, they had what I think is the prototype there, and I'm just going to explain it. So, this was pitched to me as Shadows Amsterdam is a combination of code names and Mysterium. And right away, my brain shut off, and I was like, oh, okay, so we're just kind of doing this, are we? And then I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. And it's amazing. It's, it's super awesome. So, what it is is you have one person who's like the leader and giving clues to the rest of their team. So just like code names, you have a little screen, you got like a little grid type of thing, and you kind of see the good and bad spots for where you want your team to be, and then you give them a clue. So the board that they're working with is these very surrealistically drawn tiles or cards. And they're not really surreal, they're just sort of cartoony and sort of off weird. They're not like crazy like Mysterium, Really? I mean, they kind of borderline, but they're not like way on that digs it side. It's it's still pretty grounded in reality. So there's a, there's, you kind of make a board up of those and you put, everybody puts a pawn for their team. There's a black or team and an orange team. And then you have a little map that you're looking at, a little map on a grid, and you're trying to get them to move different places. Uh, so to do that, there's a row of 10 of these same tiles 
that are just different uh, drawings and there's a, like a deck of them they're like little cards and if i want my team to try to move to a spot i give them one or two cards and that means i want them to move one or two spaces and i give them this weird picture and they look at that weird picture and go okay so what is the uh, where are they trying to get me to move is he trying to get me to move to this card right next to me or this card far away and he's trying to get me to go that direction but i can't tell him nothing because it's like code names you can't say anything and it's like mysterium you can't say anything but I give them a little picture to try to get them to move. So the object is to get the team to move the little investigator token into these three spots. And there's more than three spots they can move. And some of them are shared, like some are good for black or orange. Now, once they move there and I just say, yay, and I mark it with a little orange or black token. Now, if I've marked a spot that your team wanted to go on, if we got there first, then that spot is shut off from you. So even if you move there later and it was one of your spots that we both had, you still don't get the point. So once you move to the three spots, then there's two exits and you try to move them to the exit spots and then they don't know where it is, of course, and so they move out and then the first thing to do that wins. Now there's also spots with a red X. The red X is bad. If they land and end their turn on a red X, then you mark their little sort of, they got this little mini dashboard and if they get three red Xs, they lose, your team loses. Uh, just like the, uh, whatever, the assassin in code names. Ah, but here's the trick. You say, oh, Joel, that was terrible, boring explanation. Here's the trick. It's all done in real time. There's none of this turn garbage. <laughs> you give them a card, the other guy gives them a card, and then you re refill the row of 10 cards. You give them two cards. Once they make the move, you give them cards. You give them cards, you give them cards. So it's a race. So you're racing, 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 racing. It's really fun. The real time element seals the deal for me because it's just, it's great. There's not, it's like code, one thing with code names, like when you start playing code names, it's kind of slow. First couple of rounds, like you're trying to think and not give them a terrible clue. And it's just a little slow. Now as the board kind of shrinks in a way, it picks up speed. Uh, Myster Mysterium, I used to like Mysterium. Mysterium's super boring to me. I'd rather play this game, Shadows of Amsterdam or Deception, uh, Murder in Hong Kong. But I think, man, I love this game. This Shadows of Amsterdam, it was so fun. It took like 20 minutes to play, super fast. I was ready to play this again, like 10 more times. I just wanted to keep playing it and playing it and playing it. Now it's coming out soon from Asmodee. I think it's coming out next month. It might be a little bit later. They wanted some to have for sale at the con. They couldn't get them in. So these are just like fresh off the presses. So they got to get them into distribution and all that kind of stuff. But man, I had such a good time playing that game. It was so fun. Lots of laughing and giggling and, you know, why did you move there? You know, that kind of stuff. So super cool. Now the next kind of surprise game here uh, was from Cosmos. And it's a game called Drop It. I don't think this is a super new game, but they had it there, so I think it's relatively new. And when I told people about it, they were like, yeah, haven't you played that yet? And I was like, no, I never heard of it. <laughs> but this is sort of like, uh, almost like Connect Four, uh, but it's not. Uh, you have this sort of sort of plastic thing that you drop shapes in, uh, but they just kind of drop and fall wherever they want. And then each side will have different colored shapes. So you might have like, uh, triangles and trapezoids and circles and squares of different sizes and you just pick one up and drop it and then based on where they land you're going to score points but if you drop let's say a yellow circle and it touches anything yellow it won't score or if it touches any circles it won't score and then along the sides of this thing that you're dropping it into and along the bottom there's little colored sections so when you drop a yellow circle in if you hit the yellow on the edge of the board of the, this thing, you don't score any points. And that's it. And then as they sort of stack up and build up, then there's like little dots on the side in this little plastic thing. So if you get it touching a dot, you get extra points. And then the lines, you get worth more points. So at the beginning, you're not scoring very many points, but then you have the ability to score a lot of points as you kind of fill up this container with these pieces. Yeah, that's the game and it's super fun. And I want this game. <laughs> so yeah it's just like oh, that's super simple and i could have thought of that but i didn't <laughs> and then it's but it's really fun so that's drop it from cosmos anyway 100 percent recommend on that one and i think that's the last one or i think sorry i think there's one more let me just double check my notes here oh no there's two more so all right let's do the one because i went all the way back to the cmon and there was one i want to talk about that and this was played on wednesday and this is from Eric Lang and Antoine Bauza. And it's coming out soon, I think. I'm not really sure when the release date is, but I think it's very soon. It's called Victorian Masterminds. 
Now, what this is, the premise is that like Sherlock Holmes and all of the great detectives and investigators have disappeared. So the world is kind of ripe for the taking. And you play some of these evil masterminds trying to basically build this giant evil doomsday device, as well as it seems like blow up every government building that ever existed on the whole planet. <laughs> so, okay, that sounds like fun. And so you have this strange kind of worker placement thing, which reminds me of like Forbidden Stars or the StarCraft board game, where you will put a little token, in this case a cog, and you put it on a spot. There's a bunch of spots. You can collect resources and do special actions, but you put it face down, and then people just do that. You Okay, I put one down, you put one down. And as soon as there's three in a particular stack on a particular action space, then you flip them over, turn them up, and then you will all get to gather uh, the resource from that space. But then you also get to do, uh, most likely, the special action of the little character that's on the picture of the front of the cog. So nobody knows what you're doing exactly. They know you might be interested in that resource. And they know you're going to be interacting a little bit with that space in some degree. They don't know if you put your engineer there or your or your bomber or whatever. And all of those little uh, people have different actions they can do, allow you to blow things up, or your engineer allows you to do other cool special abilities. And then you're going to collect pieces and components to build up your doomsday device, which is going to make you more and more powerful. And then as you blow things up, then the Secret Services is going to get more and more kind of on your trail, and it's harder and harder to blow things up, so you've got to increase your firepower. And the game ends, I think, if you blow up the 12th building or I want to say somebody completes their doomsday device. And then everybody gets like a, a last round of actions or something. But it's really super fun. Uh, there's a lot of cool interplay in terms of kind of like guessing what your opponents are trying to do and kind of balancing out and sort of setting up little combos and things. And maybe you like double down, you put multiple cogs in the same action space and playing around with that interaction of when things trigger. Uh, at one point when I played the game, I, I put one of the cogs down and it just sat there for a while and I was fine with that. But then I was sort of bouncing around these other spots, getting stuff and while that, that character was sitting there and then it just worked out that bam, the right time somebody put the third one on there and I was set up to do this really cool turn. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff. It's hard to talk about again, oh, you know, mechanically on a podcast, but uh, this is one I think I, I'm pretty excited about, and I'm excited to kind of play this. I think the thing that I kind of walked away with this was I think I could get my family to play this one because it's pretty simple. You put the thing down, and then you do it, and then later on when there's three on there, you do the thing. But there's a lot of cool kind of conniving and nuance and stuff like that in there that my game group I think I'd certainly get behind. And I think my, my family group, so to speak, could sort of gravitate and move into, but we could get in and get playing without a lot of sort of strategy overhead, you know, right away. So I think this is going to be interesting. And it was cool, nice little miniatures for the, the buildings that you're going to destroy. And I like the artwork and everything and the little schematics and the blueprints and stuff for the different, uh, uh, doomsday devices were really cool and they were all kind of asymmetrical and stuff. They kind of work different ways. So there's a little bit of replayability there in terms of how those devices work. And I have been kind of wanting sort of the evil mastermind game to be a good one. A couple that I've tried just haven't been very good. And this is the first one where, you know, you're this evil Dr. Evil cartoon character um, that actually is, was a lot of fun. So I'm excited about that. So there you go. <laughs> that was Victorian Masterminds. And then finally, at the end, I'm over an hour and a half. Maybe not so much, but I don't know. <laughs> we'll see after editing. <laughs> the last one is Joan of Arc. And this is something that I backed on Kickstarter. And I jumped on the chance to definitely do... We played a full game of it. Uh, Matt from Board Game Replay will have a video going up at some point about it. Uh, so I, I, well, I will actually will show up on that video. So definitely go over his channel and take a look at it. It's not up at this time. But... I got a chance to play it with uh, with Brian from Board Game Replay while Matt filmed, and we played through a full uh, narrative a scenario. And Brian was the uh, Joan of Arc in the French, and I was the English, and I was not very nice. I was trying to come and basically burn down this village, uh, loot and burn the church, and Joan was there trying to stop me. And she could call down the power of angels. So there were some historical elements. There were some mystical and magical elements. She could have the potential to uh, find this magic sword. And that would help her, you know, increase her power and buff her up. 
Uh, but it's really neat. I'm very happy about how this game has turned out. Again, uh, mechanics is tough on a podcast, after, especially since I've been talking for a while. But it feels very much like a battle lore style of game. Uh, and instead of like a hand of cards you get and you activate certain types of troops or certain flanks and positions of troops, you activate a hex and you put down a little cube and you activate that. So I'm activating that and I can do, get to do something with all the units in that hex. But I can't activate that hex again on my turn unless I get some special ability. And then I've got to pick uh, for my other one of my other three or four actions, I activate another hex. So there's some planning and stuff involved there. And then at the beginning of each round though, a new card is going to come up and it's going to give you a certain number of actions. You're going to have three or four actions, at least in the scenario we played. So you don't know exactly how many actions you're going to get. And then there's three special cards that come up. And this is where the battle lore vibe kind of comes in, where you can choose a special action. You can say, oh, I would like an extra of these yellow cubes because the yellow cube allows you to double up on an action or a blue cube, which means I can interrupt my opponent's turn because usually it's like I do my stuff, you do your stuff. Uh, but sometimes you can do an interrupt. Or you can actually spend one of the three or four activation tokens that you get and turn it in and get some extra experience. So you're giving up an activation to then get some extra experience, which then you can use on one of your units or one of your characters. Because uh, each of the characters and units has a little card, shows you the amount of attack dice they get, and the amount of defense dice, and the special abilities. And sometimes you can turn in experience, and then you can flip the card over and then become better or, or cash in for special uh, command abilities and stuff like that. So there's some decision making. Those cards are like dealt out at the beginning of each round. So you have some interchangeable stuff that's going on, some real interesting decision points as the rounds shake out. So really, really cool. But then the scenario objectives, because remember we were playing a narrative scenario. We're not just like go here and hold this point when the person that has two out of the three points at the end of five rounds wins. That's fine. You know, I play Warhammer, that's cool. But this is cool. It was like the English needs to get six victory points. How do they get victory points? Burning down buildings, burning down the church, looting the church, injuring these characters, killing these other characters. They can get points all those different ways, and they have to do that. And Joan of Arc and and her friends, uh, they have, what was it, I think we did five rounds, but they have to stop them from doing that at the end of five rounds. So it's all those kind of different things. And if I light a building on fire and they put the fire out, the victory point gets taken away from me. So this all these cool, interesting things. <laughs> that aren't just like fight and kill and hold this thing. You know, it was this narrative things. You had to take actions to do it. Uh, and you know, that was part of your action economy was doing these narrative little bits. And like when Joan of Arc went into the church and she knew the sword was in there or there was like clues to where the sword was, then it scatters these three clue tokens out. Well, maybe I find the sword first so I can go and find it and destroy it. That's fine. That just means that uh, I get an extra victory point but she wanted to go in there and try to get it and that would have made her a badass and even more of a badass frankly and you know but she did that and so they scattered it. and then i went in and looted and burned the church and you know did she defend the village is she defend the church so all of that stuff worked really well mechanically but also worked in great with the theme and it was very immersive and brian and i both said after the end it was like yeah we were playing competitively we we're trying to win but we we're also like playing it in service of each other's story so and I was like, yes, that's exactly what these like narrative miniature games uh, are, are are really supposed to be good at. And that's the way I like to play uh, my Warhammer stuff, 40K, Age of Sigmar, whatever, honestly, is playing these narrative scenarios with nice competitive built-in mechanics that, uh, you know, drive me to try to play to win. But I'm also uh, sort of unraveling a nice little narrative bit and some cool, fun, thematic moments. And that's when they're at their best. And I felt like, I've made me super jazzed about this game and I'm super excited for it. And I mean, you can see pictures of it if you're on the YouTube, but it has come with these nice little houses and trees and the hex thing and the movement that the hex is and the little tiny, I don't know, what are they, 15 millimeter figures are really cool. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm super excited because this is just going to have a lot of that kind of stuff that I look forward to. Uh, when I play, frankly, a, a normal kind of miniatures game like, uh, you know, Warhammer. Uh, but it's going to be a different world, a different vibe, a nice mix of the historical and the magical. Like one of the cards I got was uh, raining frogs and stuff. And there's just a lot of neat things that, that are kind of built into the myth and the legend of that history. Uh, so that's Joan of Arc. And that's from uh, Mythic Games. I don't know if I said that before. 
All right, so that's kind of the whole rundown there of all the games and the fun, interesting stuff. Uh, I had a great time with the people as well. I mean, that is, as I said at the beginning, the the real takeaway. I mean, I don't know what it is. I, I, I went to Gen Con first in 2004 in Los Angeles when they had it in both L.A., and uh and in indianapolis at that time it was specifically it was in anaheim but it's pretty much la i guess well people in anaheim probably wouldn't agree with that but but anyway it's basically la and uh you know i had a good time then and then i started going again in 2011 i went for four years in a row or something and i really just kind of fell in love with the convention uh like i talked about the beginning the spectacle and everything and i was always able to play a lot of games even though no matter what i was doing if i was working a booth or running around doing videos i always made time to play games late into the night and uh and just loved it and just the way the city transforms and it was just like this it, it's such like an unreal thing especially if you've been in indianapolis like on the Tuesday, even even the Tuesday, not really, but more like Sunday night and then Monday morning, uh, it transforms back into reality. I mean, it's such an unreality when Gen Con is thumbing and pumping because, like I said, all the restaurants, they changed the menu names and they, they some of them were cosplay as the waiters and waitresses. And, you know, it, the city just transforms and is very welcoming and accepting and and uh, everybody we talk to is like Gen Con is my favorite convention out of all the different conventions that come to Indianapolis because the people are so friendly and uh, you know they don't uh, typically get drunk and smash things up and and all that kind of nonsense that happens at some of these other conventions apparently uh, I don't know anything about any of the other conventions but every single person we talked to said Gen Con is my favorite convention or they said oh what you you guys are playing this I was just in Gen Con yesterday on Saturday I saw the Warhammer Champions game I wanted to pick it up it looked really cool you know and I was like yeah you there too you're you're one of us you know and uh you know that kind of thing and it's just such a great atmosphere and environment and the vibe and I'll throw some pictures up here of uh, some of the friends that I got a chance to play with we play in this World Cup game every Wednesday before Gen Con uh, and you can see Ignacy Trevichek and Chevy Dodd they're from Portal Games and then my friends Brian and Scott and I and uh, John Richards was there and you know some other new folks were there because my buddies Alan and Rob and Brian didn't get a chance to make it this year jerks <laughs> and uh, and so you know I look forward to that every year it's just a thing uh, you know because Gen Con itself creates this sort of magical whirlwind of uh, of, of game activity and we always get forward to play this silly World Cup game and and it was an amazing time and I got a chance to hang out with the Rolling Dice and Taking Names folks at their strike tournament. We did it at the uh, the Old Spaghetti Factory. And so everybody paid like 20 bucks, I think it was, and you got a meal and some drinks and there was a strike tournament and it's silly. It's dice in a bowl versus gladiators in an arena and it's great. And they give away some games and I got a chance to sit with a couple of gamers there that were just there and they were sitting with myself and some of the folks from Restoration Games. And so we just got a chance to interact with people because we're all the same, right, in that way. We all love the games and it was great. We were all just chatting and talking about different things and how they got into games. And, uh, you know, they play a lot of couples games and they play with another couple and stuff and just kind of mixing and mingling with everybody, just having a great time. Anyway, just meeting all the people and stuff. It's just a great uh great environment and atmosphere and i hope everybody gets a chance to do it it's a zoo it's a mess it's hard to get a hotel room because it's so busy um at least it's hard to get a hotel room downtown which i recommend because it's just uh honestly if if i had to get a hotel room that's like 10 miles away i wouldn't go because <laughs> it would just you know you're gonna spend all that money on flight and hotel and tickets and everything it's just too much of a pain but if you can, if you can get in, you can get close, or you don't mind, you know, commuting or taking an Uber or a taxi or whatever, out a few miles, uh, then go for it. Because the place is just full of of game activity happening. You've got Hall A, B, C, D, E, or whatever it is that giant airplane hangar at night. You can play in there. There's the board game library. There's all the hotel spaces. There's the board game geek hot room. Uh, everything you can schedule games. I got a chance to play uh, Frostgrave with four, three other people, and the designer Frostgrave was there, and he kind of, sort of, like was the game master in a way. He kind of just there helping us out. He was helping manage the demon stuff. We just had a great time chatting, and and frankly, it's been 
several months since I had a chance to play for Frostgrave, and I forgot how fun and narrative that miniature game is. And we all had a, just a great time with <laughs> watching me destroy my own wizard as I tried to heal myself and then die. So, <laughs> so anyway, it's just, you know, just all the fun, good stuff that you can just pack in so many fun memories. You know, I remember wandering around the hall with my buddy Jonathan, and he actually works for Kingdom Death out of New York City there. And they gave him kind of like the afternoon off. He had a few hours off. He was working the booth doing demos. And uh, he's from here. He's from locally uh, outside Spokane here uh, where I'm at. And uh, he's like, hey, what's up? We're going to let's play some games. And that's when we sat down. We played uh, Kick-Ass. We played some Kingdom Domino. We played the Drop It game. And it was fun, man. We were just wandering in the halls and playing different games. We got to play that Komenots game. And it's just like game, 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 game after game. <laughs> and it's just good stuff. It's just a great, awesome environment. Everybody everybody that's there, even if they're struggling, I feel like they're putting on a brave face. And if they're not struggling, they're having actually a great time. Uh, you know, And just the energy and everything that comes off of it, it just makes me love the convention so much. Um, so I definitely recommend it. And I, I hope that uh, we can keep it positive. We can keep it on the up and up. It's a, it's a great, fantastic thing. Uh, games are great. And... Uh, I'm just going to start babbling. Maybe I'll start drooling in a minute. I'm not really sure what's going to happen. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, so that's that's the end of that podcast. <laughs> Thank you.